We're in lesson 10. This evening we're going to be studying Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through chapter 4, verse 7. And what we've just gotten through is basically Paul's legal brief. Um, that's the way it read. And I thank you so much for bearing with us. But now that Paul has convinced him of what they had been trying to do in following the law, trying to blend uh, the fact that there was more to the gospel. You remember that's what they were doing. They were saying, now that you, um, you've accepted Jesus Christ, you still have to follow the law. And so Paul has set forth all his arguments, so now he's going to apply it. What does that look like now? Now that we don't have to follow the law, what, is this, what does this mean for us? And so beginning in uh, chapter 3, verse 26, he says, For you are all sons of God. Now you can put daughter in there through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so, when we... We, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we do just thank you, Lord, that you have called us your daughters. What an amazing thing to think, Lord, that we are all princesses. We would ask, Lord, that you speak into our hearts so that we truly grasp what that means, all the riches that are available to us, Lord. Bring those to mind. Help us to truly grasp that concept. And so as we go through your word, God, we would ask that you enlighten us, that you teach us, that you bless us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be uh, reading out of the New Living Translation because I love the way it was worded in here. And we're going to start with verse 26. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So each of us, when we accepted Jesus into our hearts, God grafted the Holy Spirit into our hearts. We now have God's DNA in us. We are actually now, in a sense, biological children. Now, we are truly God's offspring because we have accepted that gift of redemption by faith. So now we're, we went through that in our little study sheets um, this week. And verse 27 says, And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on the character of Christ, like putting on new clothes. So this is the baptism of the Spirit, and it identifies you all as believers in Christ and makes him part of of his body. And it's just like putting on new clothes. Clothes. I love that uh, our missions teams, you know, whenever they're prayed over, and you know how they, they're, they're marched in front of the church, it's either on Thursday night, sometimes Sunday mornings, and they're all wearing the same outfit. I love that because it designates them. They are now part of a whole family, a team that's going forth into the mission field. And I love to see what each one is going to look like. Um, you know, and so I'm, I'm checking all the outfits out as they come through. So far, Diana, you'll be happy to know, the Samoan team was great. It was wonderful. I loved the Samoan team. In fact, my boys went on a Samoan missions trip years ago. And you know what? We still have their, their team outfit. I can't seem to get rid of it. I love it. But you know what? That's the same thing. When we are sent forth, we are now putting on Christ. And we're putting on his righteousness. And for sake of illustration, 
Okay, I have. Uh, don't worry. This is not really that dirty. But see, when we were not in Christ, we had rags on. Isn't this beautiful? Actually, I had somebody say, well, hey, that's kind of like the grunge look. And I go, well, that's true. But you know what? Our righteousness, God says, is as filthy rags. But we don't seem to realize that when we're in the world. And oftentimes, you know, we try to dress it up. And I see, oh, look at this. He will even put on big. See, now, doesn't that look a lot better? No, you see, that's what the Judaizers were doing. They were trying to dress up their own righteousness, which is filthy rags, by putting a bunch of glitter on there. And it just wasn't working. And so um, God's saying, you know what? I've done it all. You don't have to do. Whoops. I knew that was going to happen. He says, you don't have to do all that. I've already done it for you. You see, he says, take off those rags. I have clothed you. I'm not going to try to put it on. I'm just, okay, now we get to put on his righteousness. Yeah, Jeff really scored on this because... (laughs) There you go. All right. See, it worked. It it, it worked a lot smoother this morning, but... And so I said, I got this. Now that I'm practiced... I'll do it even better the next time, but that didn't work out so well. But anyway, see, now, because we are the bride of Christ, what do brides wear? White. Even though our sins were as scarlet, we are now white as snow because God has cleansed us. That's what Paul was trying to tell these guys. Don't rely on your own righteousness. It's as filthy rags. And that's pretty disgusting when you think about it. Uh, By the way, that was only tea stained, so it wasn't really all that dirty. I mean, it does look like something that my dogs dragged outside in the mud, but um, it wasn't quite. I couldn't put that on if that was the case. But anyway, that is what Paul was trying to tell them. We are now white as snow. Nothing else needs to be done. You don't have to put on any glitter and big crosses or anything like that. First, uh, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We are now white because of him. And then in our scriptures this week, verse 28 says, There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ. And so this goes way back to that, um, I think it was the second lesson where we were talking about favoritism. There's no favoritism in God's kingdom. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. That's pretty clear. There's only one. So we're all one body. We are all sisters. Isn't that wonderful to think about? We're all sisters. We get to spend eternity together. And I find that very exciting. And when one is hurt, aren't we all hurt? When you hear about a sister that's going through a difficult time, doesn't your heart just ache? But that's because we are all one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 20 through 26 says, But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And on And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having give greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice in it. I look at it this way. There are many Christians that are on the, what we would call the front lines. 
They're the pastors, they're the missionaries, the people that are able to go into inner city LA and preach on the streets. God has gifted them in that way. That is what they, that is their job. That's what God created them for. And then there's others that their job is to support them because they can't be out there without the support of, of all of you. If you aren't praying for them and supporting them, they wouldn't be able to do that. And of course, there are many ways to support in the ministry. 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11 excuse me, 7 through 10 says, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. See, we need to be utilizing, using our gifts that God has given us. And if you haven't figured out what that is, just pray. God will reveal it to you. And oftentimes, that gift is what you love to do most. If you love to pray, guess what? That's your gift. You are a prayer warrior, which you are very much needed. I think when we get to heaven, we're going to find out exactly how much those prayer warriors did. How much support they, they gave to the people that were on the front lines. But it takes all parts to be a body. Verse 29 says, And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs. And God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. So what promise is that? If we're in Christ by faith, then we too are Abraham's seed, spiritually speaking. And we will have that blessed life that God promised Abraham. These scriptures show that in God's kingdom, the blessing promised to the Jews are available to all of us. He says, nor Greek nor Jew. Remember? Um, Matthew Henry said it this way regarding this verse. He says, the Judaizing teachers would have them believe that they must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses or they could not be saved. The Judaizers wanted them to put back their rags on Those ugly rags that you can't clean up. Paul says there's no need of that. So if you are truly a child of God and sincerely believe in him, then you have become a true seed of Abraham. You're a daughter of Abraham. Isn't that cool? Of course, most of us truly are. I mean, if you uh, go all the way back, your, your lineage would eventually end up with Abraham. But we are entitled to all the great blessings and privileges as one of God's children. And we need to live like that. We never want to live in defeat. Verse 4, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 1 and 2 says, Think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up. Even though they they actually own everything their father had, They have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father sets. And so we see this in our world today. Um, If a child is uh, the, the child of some wealthy parents, and should those parents die and leave him a huge inheritance, if he's only eight years old, they're not going to give an eight-year-old millions of dollars because then they would have a a house made of candy. But (laughs) candy and video games. And so... um, Of course you wouldn't do that. So they get a guardian. You know, sometimes it's a relative, but they get a guardian. And that guardian guardian will treat them like a child and raise them up until they come of age. And so up until that point, they have to obey their guardian. That's basically what is is being said here. And so uh, the Jews were kind of like those children, but now they have no need of the guardian any any longer. We kind of studied that last week. Verse 3 says, and that's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. Before we became a Christian, we were slaves to sin. That's one of the questions in our study sheets. We were slaves to sin. We didn't realize that, but now when you look at people who are caught up in sin, aren't they slaves If they're drug addicts, aren't they a slave to the drug addiction? If they're alcoholics, aren't they slaves to the 
the, the alcoholism? Of course they are. Romans 6.16 6, says, don't you realize that you became the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God, once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey his teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin. Praise the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Of course, we don't like to think that we were once slaves of sin, but we were. Just like we see it in other people now when they don't know the Lord that's the way we once were. But what God did, what, but what Jesus said in John 8, 36 says, therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Praise the Lord. Continuing on in our scripture this week, verse four says, but when the right time came, God sent his Son, born of a woman, subject to the law. Of course, we're just talking about the virgin birth here. When the time was right, God brought Jesus into our world. And then there's something interesting it says, subject to the law. And I'm going, okay, what does that mean? Jesus, God's son, was subject to the law. Him who was truly God for our sake became a man and put himself into subjection to the law. He fulfilled the law. He was able to keep the law. He was the only person that was able to keep all 600, and, uh, 600 plus laws. He was the only one that kept them perfectly. He subjected himself to the law, and then he was sacrificed as the law requires. Of course, because he was perfect, he didn't have to, be, he didn't have to sacrifice for his own sins, so what did he do? He sacrificed for our sins. Verse 5 says, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. So it wasn't enough that he bought our freedom. Now he has adopted us as children. Years ago, I heard a story, and I cannot find it. I've tried, you know, I, I Google everything, you know me. And so I couldn't find it. And so I have re written this story by memory, but it's about a slave in ancient times. She just existed to serve her master. This master was hard to please and even cruel and abusive at times. The slave had no hope of freedom and could only dream of someday being freed from this life of bondage. The only pleasure she ever had was when guests would arrive, musicians would be called to entertain and being a servant in the great hall, she was able to serve and listen to the wonderful music. If only I could play music, she thought. But she was doomed to this life of serving any whim of the master, and that did not include music. Fill the cup, serve the food, wash the floor, clean the dishes. This is what the rest of her life would look like. Despair was her constant companion. Then one day, her master clamped an iron around her wrist and took her to the local slave market. She was to be sold again. Fear took hold of her, not knowing what to expect. She had heard stories of masters even worse than hers. What was going to happen? It was her time to go to the auction block, and she could barely walk up to the platform. She was shaking so hard. But she could only remain, if only she could remain with her old master. She was used to him. She, know, she knew what he was expected. Yes, he was mean and cruel, but it, this could be even worse. She looked out at the sea of people bidding for her, and she could only head, hang her head in shame and let fate have its way. She never looked at the person who had purchased her as she was simply left off, led off the platform. She paused with surprise when the shackle was removed, though. She was led to the new master's estate full of fear and trepidation. What was expected of her? Was her new master going to be mean, cruel, abusive? She was led to the main house and now stood before her master. The master's kindly face stared into her eyes and simply said, You are free. I have redeemed you, and you, no, you are no longer a slave. He let this sink in for a moment and continued, As I see it, you have two choices. You can leave and try to survive in this world, or you can remain here under my care. Everyone here once was a slave and has been set free from slavery. 
If you stay, you will have to work, as we all do, and you can leave at any time. She couldn't believe what she was hearing. Taking a deep breath, she told the kindly master that she wanted to stay. He says, excellent. What is it you like to do most? Confused, the girl replied that she'd always wanted to play music. Consider it done. I know of a great musician who would love to train a new music enthusiast. This will be your job here. Oh, and one more thing. Everyone who works here, I have adopted as my own child. I would like to adopt you if it's okay. You would inherit part of my estate. And don't worry, I own a thousand cattle on a thousand hills. So there's plenty to go around. And you can call me Abba or Father, whichever you prefer. See, that is what Jesus has done for us. That's exactly what he's done. It's what our Heavenly Father has done and adopted us, and we are now daughters of the King. Isn't that wonderful? Verse 6 in our scripture says, And because we are his children, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Of course, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, that DNA grafting that's in their heart now. Jesus, at the end of his time here on earth, said to his disciples, in John 14, 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. And then in John 15, 26, he says, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father will testify of me. See, that's the promise we have. God's not going to just leave us to flounder in this world. Remember, you have now got, you now have the Holy Spirit grafted into your heart. He's that, that small voice that's always speaking to you, encouraging you. See, the enemy, I always look at him as a bullhorn. Have you ever seen those, uh, those guys, uh, you see coaches oftentimes like on football teams. He's got that bullhorn and he's screaming and yelling. That's how I, I hear the enemy. Whenever the enemy wants to get into my head, he'll be screaming so loud, all I can hear is him. And then I'll have the Holy Spirit going, now haven't I told you? Haven't I taught you? The enemy is the big mouth. I'm the calm, still voice. So I always remember that, you know, whenever the enemy is blasting. But verse 7 says, You are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you an heir. We receive adoption as daughters. And it's a great privilege which believers have through Christ when they are adopted children of the God of heaven. Amen? We, who by nature were children of wrath and disobedient, have become children by grace and love. I mean, it's amazing. It's almost too good to be true, but it is true. And that's so cool that God wants all his children to resemble him. Do you realize that? That is why he is trying to make us more like Christ. That is why we have the Holy Spirit. God wants us to resemble Jesus Christ. We want, he wants us to have his temperament. I, one of the greatest blessings of being a parent is when your kids start to become or look like you and act like you. As long as you're acting reasonable, I remember sometimes, you know, they're, they're like little parrots. And I remember my sons mimicking things that I said and it was a great lesson because I oh my goodness I have to remember to watch what I say because they will copy everything but you know what when they pick up godly traits that they have learned from us don't you love that it's like oh that just blesses my heart you know I see that see that in both of them now that they're beginning to kind of resemble us as we resembled Jesus our kids were kind of they were learning about how to become more Christ-like by copying us. And that was such a blessing for us. It's like, wow, we really are having an effect. And of course, now they own it themselves. You know, they are, they are receiving from the Holy Spirit. But before they were at that, before they were at that age where they could accept Jesus on their own, they would, they would copy us. And they would become like us. And then sometimes they actually resemble us. Of course, they don't really resemble me too much, but they certainly resemble Jeff. And I love it because one time um, 
when Austin was growing up, Steve Mays had looked at Austin and said, Jeff, Austin looks just like you, even walks just like you. Remember, Jeff, you walk like a duck, and Austin's beginning to walk like a duck. And I was just cracking up. And as they were walking away, Jeff and Austin are side by side, and I went, oh, my goodness, they do walk like a duck. And so I thought that was really cute. You know, it's just a, just a slight pigeon toe, you know. But, um, you know, if you ever look at Austin, he looks just like his dad. And that just makes a parent proud. When, you know, wow, they look just like me. Why? Because they have our DNA in them. See, we're supposed to start look, looking more and more like Jesus because we now have his DNA in us. 1 John 3, 1 through 3 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. See, the world doesn't know us. They don't recognize us. They can't figure us out. They don't know what makes us tick because they don't understand God. They don't have that, that Holy Spirit DNA grafted into them. We are being transformed into the image of Christ. And in this verse is a wonderful promise and blessing that one day we will be like Jesus. One day we will be in heaven and we will be perfect. We will not have to be in this body of sin any longer. Isn't that a wonderful day? Until that day, we must be patient with the process. Don't lose heart. Stay the course. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 15 says, So think clearly and exercise self-control. Look forward to the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as, child, as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. See, because we are God's child, he does not want you to be disobedient. Why? We looked at that last week. Sin is so destructive. God would not be a loving father if he did not chasten you. I guided and directed my sons because I love them. I wanted them to grow up to be good adults. And sometimes that can be difficult. They don't like to be chastened. Kids don't like to be told what to do. They certainly don't like to be grounded. And they certainly don't like to have their, their cell phones taken away. Have you ever had to do that one? Oh, you would think that you were killing them. Or better yet, you took one of their video games away. See, that's more of a boy thing. You know, if I wanted to really get through to my boys, take away their video games. And boy, you would really hear some hollering then. And boy, they were squeaky clean after that. But um, God is the same. He does it because he doesn't want you to be hurt by sin. Because he loves you too much. Hebrews 12, 7 through 11 says, If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate. You see what it's saying there? If God didn't chasten you, then you're not really one of his kids and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Don't worry about the spankings. God spanks those that need the spanking, and we all need spankings from time to time, don't we? And then verse 10 says, For indeed, for a few days, chasten, chasten us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but 
painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. See what it's saying? It's not something to fear. Those are corrections, and we all need those because we are still in this sinful body. We are still prone to sin. That's why God corrects us, just as a loving parent corrects their kids. Um, My sons are avid snowboarders and skiers. Um, One of them loves to snowboard, Austin, and Brandon's a skier. Now, they are definitely Jeff's boys, very adventuresome, and they push the envelope. But they also hate to wear their helmets, And so they were constantly, oh, please, please, can we not have, I don't want to have to wear my helmet. It's awkward, it's heavy, it's hot. You know, they come up with all these excuses. I said, no, no, you have to wear your helmet. I've seen you ski. I've seen you snowboard. I could always spot them from the lodge. You look for the kid going down the steepest run in a straight line because they had this competition going, see who could go the fastest. And you had to show proof. You know, their phone had this little app that told them how fast they were going. Yeah, right now, um, Brandon, he's the skier, he's winning, and, you know, it's a constant competition. Whenever they go um, skiing and snowboarding, you know, they try to beat the other's time. And so, right now, Brandon's clocked at 78, Austin's at 76, and boy, is it killing him. And so, you know, he's not sure he's going to be able to beat his brother because his brother's on skis and skis are faster. But, you see, I say, you are not going to... You're not going to ski and snowboard like that without your helmet. But they would always push it. And if I caught them without their helmets on, immediately, we're out of here. Off the mountain, we're going home. And boy, did they hit it. Oh, well, we promise we won't do it again. No, you knew the rules. We got to go. Because it's too dangerous to ski and snowboard the way you two boys do and not have your helmet on. And see, that's because I love them. I like their brains in their head. (laughs) So don't fear those spankings from the Lord. They're always for our own good. Hebrews 13, 20 through 21 says, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, Though the blood, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Remember how much God loves you and wants you to be like his son. And in that, you are promised a full life of joy and peace. That was the promise to Abraham that he would have a, a, a life full of peace and joy and blessing. And who doesn't want that? That's why he says, follow my laws. And of course, we know what the two most important ones are. Love God, love others as yourself. And if you follow those, then everything else falls in place. Who wouldn't want to serve a master like that? But he really isn't our master. He's our heavenly father because we are daughters of the king. Jesus said in John 15, 15 through 16, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain in whatever you ask the father in my name, he will give you. Isn't that a wonderful friend? He is our friend, our Heavenly Father. Amen? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Abba, we are so grateful, Lord, that we are your daughters. Lord, help us never to fear that chastening that you do for us, Lord. It's to keep us on that straight and narrow, and we do need it from time to time, Lord. So we thank you for that. Help us never to fear that chastening, Lord, that correcting, but that we would embrace it. And as we break up into our groups, God, and we, we look in this, these scriptures further, Lord, we would ask that you speak into our hearts even more to solidify those things which you would have us to learn. We love you, Father, and we just thank you so much that you have called us your daughters. We praise you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.